Okay. I'm going to do a presentation on a low power, 144 megahertz, single polarization amateur radio station that I built over the last um, roughly eight months or so. Let's see. Okay, the outline of the talk is shown here. The objective, obviously, we're going to talk about um, how I got to this point. You have to know about the moon, so there's some lunar characteristics I'll describe. Ionospheric propagation is still very important at VHF frequencies, even if you get through the ionosphere. And then I'll describe the station that I built, uh, the parts that are listed, the cost of the station. And then I'm going to go into some details on the JT65B signal format and coding that's used to send the signal to the moon and receive and decode the signal. And then I'll give examples of EME operation. I've got a total of six QSOs right now, starting from January. It doesn't always work, I can tell you that. <laughs> and then we'll summarize. The other thing is the reason why I did this in terms of the objective is this is the 50th year, as everyone knows, the anniversary of the first lunar, lunar landing. And um, so we're celebrating that in a sense by doing this. And I wanted to do it before the end of the year. So to do this, it's not a simple matter of just putting together parts. You have to talk to people to understand what the conventions are in the communications. So these are the people that helped me, the EME Elmers, as it were, including Dennis Hall, um, Ed McDowell, uh, Bill Corbin, Jim Spears, and Dr. Marshall Williams. Turns out that um, I met Bill Corbin through an ac accidental um, transmission. I thought it was my first EME, mess uh, EME communications. It turned out to be a terrestrial link to Rhode Island. So I was getting in his silos, and I thought, boy, I got a moon contact and it wasn't. I emailed him and, and he told me that it wasn't. So eventually we got together and had about a three hour lunch. And they, uh, both Jim and Bill told me all the details, the, the websites you need to go to to set up what the conventions are. For example, if you're in the west, you transmit on even minutes. In the east, it's odd minutes. All right, so the project name is Project Selene. It's interesting because now NASA has a, a Project Artemis. They're both goddesses of the moon with different emphasis, but this is Selene. <laughs> After all the uh, ancient gods and goddesses that are used for space projects. So in case anybody doesn't know, this is what we mean by Earth Moon Earth Link. I transmit a signal from Connecticut, goes up to the moon, is reflected by the moon, it comes back to Earth with a time delay of about two and a half seconds, roughly, depending on the position of the moon. And then it's available to anybody on the Earth that has a view of the moon and the proper equipment. And I'm doing this at two meters. So starting with some of the physics associated with this problem, the range of the moon, it's um, roughly about 250,000, 240,000 miles. The lunar diameter, you need to know that to calculate the angular extent of the moon. Is the moon bigger than my beam width or smaller? In this case, it's obviously much smaller. It's about a half a degree. My beam width eventually was about 38 degrees. So it's very easy to point, put it that way, compared to an optical system like this laser. Um, I'm partially a radar guy, partially a communications guy. Worked at MIT Lincoln Laboratory. So I see this as a radar problem. A lot of guys look at it as a communications problem. You have to know the radar cross-section of the moon. So the lunar cross-section is expressed here in terms of square meters. It's easier to see it in terms of dB reference to a square meter. So it's about 118 uh, dB SM. Uh, the other thing you can do, you need, is the lunar reflectivity. So I had to search for that. And it turns out that it's about 7%. And I've got charts to back up these numbers. And then finally, for a radar guy, you have to know what the probability density function is for the radar cross-section. Uh, some people assume that it's a Rayleigh distribution. You'll see that it's more of a Ricean distribution, and I'll explain that as we go on. And then the signal fades, and that's associated with lunar libration, which is a certain type of motion, which I'll show you. So this is a plot of the RCS. There were a lot of measurements on the moon uh, properties in the early 60s for obvious reasons. So the radar cross-section is shown here. It was done at UHF. And here's the median value. So half the time the cross-section is less, and half the time the cross-section is higher. 
but it, it's over roughly about 118 or so, plus or minus five or so, something like that. So it's a pretty steady target, as you'll see in the next couple of slides. So this is what I meant by the probability density function. If you're going to calculate the probability of detection for a radar, you have to know what the distribution of the RCS is in a probabilistic sense. So typically what you would do is integrate this. You have a threshold, and then everything above the threshold is detectable. Everything below it isn't. So um, there's arguments about what type of distribution you have. A Rayleigh distribution is just like this laser. If you've seen laser speckle before, you see all this, the pattern fluctuating. That's from a diffuse source, source, roughly 10 or more scatters of equal strength. They interfere with, this, with each other in your eye, and you see the, you see the interference pa pattern in your eye. A Ricean is different. A Ricean is a strong signal with some weak scatterers. So there's one dominant signal here, and that's probably the lunar mare, which are the smooth areas that they thought were seas on the moon. That's the principal source of the reflection. So we're not even using the entire lunar disk. We're using just the um, closest portion, the smooth portion, where the astronauts landed in most cases. So here's another measurement to look at what happens to the polarization. <clears throat> if you have a um, steady target, say a metal target, the return polarization will be preserved. So vertical in, vertical out, and so on. If you have circular polarization, right-hand circular out, when you're viewing it, it's coming back as left-hand circular. So that presents a bit of a problem, plus it's a more complicated antenna. So I, I have a uh, linearly polarized antenna. And you can see here again, the specular reflection preserves the linear polarization as a function of time. So this is going out across the lunar disk. This is the mare portion. Most of the signal is from this, so it's confirmed in a, uh, another measurement. And then finally, how does the, the cross-section depend on wavelength? Well, it's pretty well um, the same reflectivity. It's about 7% reflectivity from um, 1 centimeter to um, 10 meters. So here we are at 144 megahertz. And you can see the fluctuation in the measurements. People make measurements. Part of that's the, uh, the lunar libration causing fluctuations in the measurements that they make. But this is what I took. So if you want to calculate the cross-section for a target like this, a sphere is handy. You take the reflectivity times the cross-sectional area of the moon. And that gives you the 118 dBSM. So I, so I use that in the calculations because I wanted to do the calculations before I spent $5,000 on the radio equipment. So it's sort of like what engineers do. They set, they look at the problem, analyze it, decide what, what you need. So now we're going to talk about some of the impairments to the communication link. One of them is the geometric signal polarization rotation. This means basically, um, I think I might have skipped the slide there, yeah. If you're here in Massachusetts and somebody is in Europe and you're transmitting what you think is horizontal, when somebody's receiving that from the moon, it is not horizontal. It's because they're at a different position on the globe. And so that's another random variable. Who am I going to talk to? Well, we don't know who we're going to talk to when we send out a CQ. Uh, so, and that is also a function not only of the position on the Earth, but the position of the moon. So what I plotted here is what the lunar motion is during the first time I did my QSO on January 13th. You can see the moon um, elevation and azimuth changing. So that changes <coughs> the angle at the two stations that I talked to using JT-65B. You can see here, um, this guy was in Leningrad, I mean, um, St. Petersburg. And you can see the polarization change here is about 14 degrees per hour versus 27 degrees per hour. The QSO only lasts about six minutes, so that isn't too much. But it's still a random variable. You don't know what this is going to be. Here it's minus 48, here it's minus 60. If, if there was somebody in England, it would be yet another number. So that's the first part of the random nature of the polarization that, that is received. So the other part, and this is more important, is the um, ionospheric effect on VHF polarization. So. Uh, probably most of, you, most of you are aware that the ionosphere is birefringent. It basically takes a linear polarization, even if it's HF, it's going to convert it to a circular polarization or an elliptical polarization in a more general sense. 
and those two waves are going to propagate different paths if it's refracted, HF. So you get two different locations on the ground for V and H if you have an antenna that's V or H. So um, circular polarization is immune to that. So it passes through the, the ionosphere with additional rotation, but it doesn't change the sense of the polarization. So it's still right-hand circular. So how does this depend on what's happening in the atmosphere? Okay, you can see here the same drawing. Here's the E-field, the propagation vector. In this case, is aligned with the Earth's magnetic field. That's another variable. How are you passing through the ionosphere? What is the electron density? And it's actually an integral. This is just a, uh, an approximation. It's an average value. How long is the path? How strong is the Earth's magnetic field? That changes across the Earth's surface. So it, it leads again to a random number of waves of rotation or 90 degree polarization shifts. You can see here, it gets worse as you go to lower frequencies. This is why I asked the question the other day, yesterday of the guy who did 50 megahertz. Did, did you have a problem with this? He said no. He must have had a big <laughs> system then, high power, uh, high bandwidth, I mean a high uh, power aperture product. But so we're here at 144 megahertz. You can count on many, many polarization shifts. So again, a random variable. This is a measurement done by uh, Dr. Joe Taylor, the guy who basically developed a lot of the digital formats that we use, FT8, JT65B, and so on. He made a monostatic measurement, a round trip measurement, going out to the moon and back uh, for a whole evening in January 2015, and you can see the polarization changing. And here it's changing rapidly, and here it isn't. So again, how do you, how do you figure this into your calculations? Well, the way I looked at it, and I'm from Connecticut, so we have some Indian casinos nearby. And there's an interesting example of a, of a roulette wheel. Imagine a roulette wheel spinning. Forget about the green zero and double zero. Three, 36, every 10 degrees there's a, a spot for the ball to last, land. So you throw the ball in, you don't know where it's going to land if it's a fair game. Same thing here. So what does that mean? To me it means a uniformly distributed random variable. So what is the expected value of that? Okay, the expected value would be um, 45 degrees. Half the time it's less than 45 degrees, half the time it's more than 45 degrees. Remember, it's spinning around, so it's more than 45 degrees, but to our antenna, or the other guy's antenna, it's either zero or 90 degrees. So these are, this is a summation of how the, why it's random, random variable. So here's a plot of the probability of polarization loss is a function of, um, as a function, well, probability is a function of polarization loss. So the medium loss is 3 dB. So half the time it's 3 dB or less. On the other hand, if your antenna is cross-polarized, this is the cross-pole response of the antenna. It could be down 20 dB, 30 dB, depends on your antenna. So this is really not where I'm working. And since it's a random variable, there are a lot of times when I was calling somebody, I couldn't hear them. I'll get to that as, as we continue. But I think this was the main culprit. So um, then I looked at, at antennas. Should I put, mount my antenna with horizontal polarization or vertical polarization? So I have the um, antenna modeling program, Easy NEC version 6 plus. And this is a model for the antenna that I eventually bought, a nine element Yagi. So I have one antenna, nine elements. It has a nominal antenna gain of about 14.1 dB. If you mount it with vertical polarization, um, about one wavelength above the ground, about two meters off the ground. You don't have to get up high to do the moon. You get a very small improvement, and it's hard to put the RF energy on the ground. That makes sense. So you're not going to look at the moon at zero degrees. You're going to have to look at it after it's come up a bit. On the other hand, if you do horizontal, 18.61 dB versus the 14.2. So that's a great improvement here. So, so what do I do? I, I use this antenna. When I pointed it, I pointed it directly at the moon. I would have done better if I pointed it horizontally. There would have been more gain, as you'll see later. Okay, so the conclusion was uh, Yagi horizontal polarization. You get higher gain. It also means, it also determines when I can operate. So now I'm going to describe, describe the system that I have. It's at my home. 
We're in the middle of a development, so I can't keep the antenna up all the time. I don't think the neighbors would appreciate a 14 and a half foot Yagi antenna right here. And so this defines how I can look at the moon. First of all, I have to look at the moon at a low angle. So I can't shoot the beam through this guy's house. I have to shoot it between his house and swimming pool and these trees. So there's a window here. So I have to calculate when the moon's going to appear there at a low elevation angle. So I'd have the antenna gain. Uh, there was one, I have to admit, there was one, measure, one, one um, communication link with a, uh, a station in Italy where I transmitted like this, but he was at a high elevation angle and I just barely made it. So I do really need the antenna gain. Calculated the RF hazard zone, it's about 80 feet on the main beam and you can't get the energy down on the ground anyways. And then it's about, I think about 20 feet in the side lobes, worst case. All right, here's a photograph to show that notch between the trees and the house. This is me holding a camera that shoots a photo of this four pi steridians. So you can see the top of my head here. My radio is located back in here in the garage. This is where I shoot, right here. So the moon's got to be right there. So that means there are only like a couple of days a month that I can do this until I get more antennas or more power. So there's a window. And here's the window for the, the first night that this worked in January. Uh, you see the moon rising and the angles and so on. So it was on the order of about, looks like about an hour and a half or so. And you can see the elevation rates and so on. Again, it shows that this is not a difficult thing to track. A lot of people buy systems to, to have their antenna track satellites. You don't have to do that with a QRP EME system. You point it by hand, you use a magnetic compass. I couldn't see the moon when I did this. But I was able, because the beam width is so large, I was able to uh, illuminate the moon. Here's a view of the house with less distortion in the image. Here's the antenna. Here's my garage where I worked out of and just ran a very small, short distance cable here to minimize the cable losses. And that works most of the time, or some of the time. Here's another view of the um, M squared antenna. Uh, nine elements. It's set for single sideband because that's what horizontal polarization is used for, two meters. I measured the, um, the VSWR of the antenna in situ, that is where it was located. I wanted to see what is the VSWR, I don't want to destroy my, my amplifier. And you can see it's very well behaved. Uh, this is the region here where you do the EME, so it's very, very low, at least when that measure was done. But as you know, antennas sort of age. You bump the, the elements against the, the garage wall or something like that, and things change, but it's still okay. Here's a block diagram of the EME station. So um, the heart of the uh, radio is the ICOM 9100, which does all, all bands that are of interest to me anyways. All HF, VHF, UHF, it does long duty cycle. Uh, by the way, this image is also on my website, the, the qrz.com website, uh, although I added this here. Um, so, so I did this as unconventional. I have the antenna here, but I have the amplifier, the preamplifier behind the, the linear amplifier, the power amplifier. And that's because I don't want to destroy this with um, high power or some problem with the VSWR increasing the power at the uh, input of this LNA. This is a Vox operated LNA. Most people use sequencers, so they know you transmit, you receive, in a fixed order, you take the signal from the, the transceiver and you know when to do this. This is simpler and this works. The only penalty is that you're behind this guy and you lose another half dB. Ideally this would be put right up here at the, um, at the interface to the antenna and the noise figure would be a lot lower. Here you can see the noise figure would be a half dB versus roughly one and a half dB. And one other thing too, um, this LNA is powered by this transceiver, 12 volts comes up to this LNA. It powers the circuitry here as well as the, um, the Vox portion of it. Um, more recently I found that that had died and I was trying to do EME without an LNA and it doesn't work very well. So <laughs> that contributed to the failure rate. So how much, what does the system look like? Here's a list of parts and I included everything including the, the software for the antenna. The, um, analysis. 
and an antenna analyzer, the Chinese antenna analyzer that's very cheap, works out to 2.7 gigahertz, it's kind of neat. And these are the parts and it costs roughly about a little less than $5,000. So it's a major investment, you gotta do the calculation to see if it's gonna work. Or you gotta somehow make it work if, you, if it doesn't work. So this is a list of the parameters for it. Another way of looking at it, here's the antenna. Again, it's about two meters high. Um, using JT65B, and the antenna gain at the angle I was using it at was only 16, and roughly 16 and a half dB. And another important parameter is this so-called power aperture product. Um, you can look at the big gun stations. This only works with the big gun stations. So what is a big gun station? Okay, you can do the calculations about 50 dBiW, as you'll see. All the guys that I worked were over 50 dBiW. I'm running less than 40 dBiW. So this is a QRP, a challenged, uh, antenna challenged, power challenged. They're running kilowatts, and you'll see some of the antennas. It's arrays of antennas, Yagis. So now I'm gonna to try to describe the JT65B signaling and performance. Also needed to understand what the SNR would be. So now, there are two types of messages that are used by JT65B. One is a long message waveform. And that has the initial uh, CQ information, um, you know, CQ and then acknowledgement of the CQ, that type of thing. This particular waveform has 65 different tones. It's a frequency shift keyed waveform, 65 tones. One tone is the sync, the other 64 are a 64 airy alphabet. So each of those tones carries six bits of information. So um, Dr. Taylor included a low rate uh, uh, Reed Solomon code where only 19% of the bits are information, all the rest are error correction bits, for forward error correction. So this is, he does something like this for FTA too. To pull the signal out of the noise, you have to have error correction. And he does it in this fashion here, interleaving symbols and matrices and interleaving it so that if you get a fade, it doesn't destroy the whole message. This message is sent once. And um, you can see the times here. It's about a third of a second per tone, transmitting one of 65 frequencies. It's very important to have frequency synchronization and time synchronization. I mentioned how everybody starts, there's a, there's a, um, a convention of when you transmit whether you're east or west of who you're talking to, and also um, the time of transmission. In this case, it's 47.8 seconds to transmit one message, the CQ message. So the period is like every other minute you're transmitting. So to illustrate that, I've got this moon globe here. I'm gonna make it a little brighter here. And the colors are gonna represent different frequencies. We'll start off with white. There's the moon that's not being illuminated by my radio. So you send a sync pulse. Sync pulse will be red for a third of a second. Then the message begins. There's one six bits, another six bits, another six bits. Those are error correction bits and message bits, and so on. Then they throw in sync pulses in a pseudo-random fashion. So they can then do a, a, a determination of, of time. So once all that's done, Uh, there's a so-called Frank Taylor, Dr. Taylor again, and a, a colleague, Frank, developed a algebraic, an algebraic soft decision algorithm. That is, you look at the data and you take the best possible combination. In other words, it looks like the message was this. I was thinking about this this morning, and you know about match filters for detection. Match filter, okay, in this case, this is the ultimate match filter. It's time synchronized, it's locked in frequency, it's got a certain code that's recognized by both sides. This is how we're gonna code, this is how you decode. And then finally, the neat thing is the last line there, the deep search decode. It has a list of all the operators that do this. There are about 6,000 people in the world that do this. And I didn't know that. Whenever I first started off and I made my Rhode Island contact, I was getting error messages. Uh, call three text missing, call three text missing. What the hell is that? So. It turns out it's, you have to go to a website, register your equipment, so all the people that do this know that you're there. 
This is part of the mesh filter too. It reduces the entropy, the uncertainty in the message. There are only a certain number of people that are going to be communicating with you. So frequency, time, polarization, code, and who's talking. It's all done to minimize the required signal to noise ratio for the long message. So there's another issue with regard to the moon. The moon doesn't just do a simple elliptic orbit. There's some uh, other motions you can see here. And that, that's what causes a sm very small Doppler shift at 140 megahertz. You'll see what the numbers are. Dr. Taylor has, has calculated it. But it's on the order of a hertz or so. But even off, being off by about a hertz can cause an issue. As you can see here, this is the calculated lunar libration induced Doppler spread. It's best at 144 megahertz, obviously, because it's the lowest frequency. I didn't do 50 megahertz. But it's on the order of, well, W50 means, um, that's like the half power point. It's about a half a hertz. That means the energy is being smeared. If you have a mesh filter and you're, you're going to do a, a decode looking for a specific frequency, you have a, a bin, a, 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 a bandpass filter. Some of that energy is going to spill out of that, and it reduces the signal to noise, as you'll see in the next chart. So this is, if you look on the web, you'll see people say, well, you know, JT65B works at minus 25, it works at minus 28. What does it work at? This is what it works at. It depends on what your Doppler shift is and what the probability of receiving the message is. You can see on the vertical axis there. So I've made contacts down to minus 30 dB or so with this which is right on the edge. It means retransmitting and transmitting again and again and again. Each of these is an independent trial. Look at it that way. So then there's the shorthand message. This is the end of the QSO. You've exchanged the, um, the necessary ID, you know, the call signs. And then you, you want to say, okay, well now I, I received it, RO. Or, and then you reply R, 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 the other guy said 73, then you say 73. How are these messages encoded? Very simple, it's, he sends, you send the sync and you send the tone. And you don't need timing information, you don't need uh, frequency synchronization, you need the difference frequency between those two tones. And that's what these, these uh, decoder, you know, delta F is 100 hertz, 161. So they're looking for that. So how do they build up the signal to noise ratio? There's no forward error correction here. They repeat the message 16 times. So they integrate 16 of those measurements and say, okay, it looks like it's RO or RRR or 73. So there's no information on who sent it, but that's, and the timing is off, doesn't matter. You can see the performance is better than the long message. And that's because there's less information in this message. You need less energy to send a message that's shorter than longer. So what does that look like? Okay, so we said that red was sync. So say uh, RO would be red, green. Red, green. Red, green. And then you'd go to say RRR might be red, blue. Red, blue. You take the difference and you get, you get the message. So repeat it 16 times. This is what a QSO looks like, my first QSO. You can see the timing there. The transmissions start one second after the clock. You have to set your computer, like FT8, you have to set your computer and your radio, your time, to about an order, the order of about a tenth of a second. And then it works. If you don't, then it won't even decode. FT8 doesn't decode. You probably, some of you have found out. So this is what it looks like. CQ, uh, Maidenhead locator, Foster at November 4-1, and then response by the guy in St. Petersburg. And then I say, okay, I got you. Oh, 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 you don't say, you don't say the, um, you know, the standard, uh, like 559 or whatever. The response is O. Oh. So it's O, oh, O, oh, O. Oh. That means it's good, and you say R, O, oh, then R, 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 and 73, and that's it. So the, the first three lines are encoded in 378 bits using the tones I described and so on. The others are the short messages I had described. Let me turn off the moon here. Okay, now, Earth Moon operations. Okay, how did it actually work? All right, this is what the moon looked like. It was at night in January, it was cold. I have this in my garage, it's unheated. To heat the garage up first, use all the power to heat up the garage. 
turn off the heater, then you turn on your radio. So it's a pain to do this. I have to set up the antenna each time outside. All right, so there's more software here, prediction software. Where is the moon? What kind of rotation do you have, you know, specific to um, the station you're calling? And also, um, in this case, what is the sky temperature? Uh, one of the more, uh, one of the talks, two talks ago, they were talking about the temperature of the universe, 3 Kelvin. Well, that's not the case at 144 megahertz or UHF. It's hotter than that. And when the sun is in your field of view, which is right here, this is sun. The sky temperature goes way up. The sun, the sun is five or 6,000 Kelvin. Uh, it, it's a black body source. It's going to raise the noise in the receiver. That's what happens in a new moon. The new moon, the, sun, the moon is in front of the sun. In a full moon, you're more down here. You could be down here somewhere. And then I have to catch the moon at the right point. So another restriction on when you can do this. This software is free and available. Unfortunately, the guy who did it died recently. His software also shows where the moon was. In the case of the QSO with uh, Russia, it was over in North Africa. The sun is over here, and here's where I am in Connecticut. And um, again, talked about the radio sky. This is the radio sky. I think it said actually uh, UHF. So it's not uniform. You don't see a three Kelvin background. This is the Milky Way galaxy. All the stars in there, I mean, that's the radio astronomer's signal. You can see the signal there in radiometry. So it's hot there. This is where the sun is. This is where the moon was when I did my measurement. This is my beam width. So the beam width can encompass radio sources to, reduce, to increase the noise in your receiver. So that's another factor. The last chart that I showed you, if you use it properly, it keeps you away from the hot objects like the Milky Way galactic plane. And by the way, this sine wave here is the so-called ecliptic plane. That's where all the planets pretty much and the moon and the sun travel. Uh, somebody asked me once, what is this thing? Okay, it's a Mercator projection of the sky. These are the coordinates, declination and right ascension. So all stars are, have a specific location for the most part. They're not moving that much on this Mercator projection. So this is what the sky looks like to a radio telescope or to my receiver. Again, this is um, where I was operating, shooting between the house and the trees. There's my antenna gain. It, it's um, two meters height. And this is the, what the QSO looks like, the first QSO. So you can see the sync pulses here. You can't see the complex long messages. But you can see, I can see in this uh, waterfall display, the tones that are associated with RO and 73. It's the difference frequency between here and the sync. 1470 hertz and 1577. These are tones from uh, Romeo X-ray 1 Alpha Sierra. Um, the display it looks sort of like an FT8 type display. It turns red whenever you get somebody calling you. And I'm yellow over here on the, the, the screen. Um, I think the decoder sometimes has a delay. It scrambled some of these, these uh, the order of some of these messages uh, in here for example, and I've unscrambled it in the next chart. But you can see the, the messages here that were sent, just like FT8, and for obvious reasons. So this is unscrambled, this is what it looks like. And the signal to noise ratio is reported just like in FT8. It's reported in the, in the uh, margins here. You can see the time delays. Let's see, the time delay here, you can't see it. It says 2.2 seconds. So the round trip travel time at that point was 2.4 seconds. So there's two tenths of a second error in his clock or my clock or both. Uh, there's no timing information in these because we said timing wasn't important. There's no synchronization with the short messages. And the signal to noise ratios are under, let's see, right here. These are the numbers. So I have a calculation now that will use these numbers, specifically the long message. Because without that, it's not going to work. Um, confirmation. How do you know that it actually works? Well, there's another website that's by uh, November Zero Uniform One, or K, I guess it is. November Zero Uniform K. He runs this website, and this is like 
a dating game in a sense. You meet your QSO partner here, and you can potentially set up a schedule transmission. I did not do that in this case. I was sending CQ and this guy noticed it, and he said, Bill, we'll call you. And here's his call sign. He's got a four times 15 element cross polarized antenna, and I think that means he's running a kilowatt. So the rules of this website are you can't communicate this way when you're doing a QSO. You can only, otherwise it doesn't count. So you have to wait till it's over. And you know what's happening anyways at your radio station. You can wait till it's over. And then, again, this is a blow up of one of these lines. You can see this. It describes what he sent. Thanks for the QSO. And he repeats, I think this is the signal to noise ratio minus 24. This is probably the angle, polarization angle. He was, he used to um, un, un, uh, rotate the rotation. These big gun stations have cross-polarized antennas and adaptive polarization. So they can take that out. So I've modeled that in the equation just to, you know, there's no, very little loss in polarization for these guys. Here's what his system looks like. Where he's located, you can see the four antennas here. They're cross-polarized. 4 by 15 cross-polarized. So that's 15 elements each, H and V, on each of the four. And his power aperture product, again, over 50 dB, that's a big gun station. And he's using a version of MAP65, which does the adaptive polarization correction. Okay, so this is a summary of the first two QSOs. You see some of the numbers. Um, actually, it's just the uh, Romeo X-ray 1 Alpha Sierra QSO. The temperature of the sky still was pretty warm. The other thing is my side lows are touching the ground. So that's going to bring in additional noise too, uh, at least natural noise, or maybe be artificial noise. Typically what I'll do is turn off all the fluorescent lights and LED lights in the area. No cell phones, no nothing. So make it as quiet as possible. But it was a QSO that was about 450,000 miles. <laughs> so this is the calculation. So I have a spreadsheet. This is a simple calculation. This is the radar equation. Um, in a spreadsheet form. And the, the yellow are the inputs, like the temperature, you get that from the, the software. Transmit power was about 180 watts. Antenna gain, approximately that. Receiver noise figure and so on and so forth. The interesting thing here is uh, the received signal, minus 184 dBm. So what is that? Okay, we know about microwatts, nanowatts, femtowatts, Attawatts. This is zeptowatts. This is a couple hundred zeptowatts. Ten to the mi it's more than it's ten to the minus eighteen. So it's 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 incredible that, that you can actually decode a signal with zeptowatts present. So what is the final signal to noise ratio? Again, the way the convention is to re reference it to the signal to noise ratio in a twenty five hundred hertz band. That's sort of like the standard single side band version. So it's reference to that. So it gives you an idea of how much more sensitive this is compared to single sideband or CW. So again, here the signal to noise that I calculate should have been minus 18.7. I threw in the 3 dB loss, but it wasn't that. It was much less if you saw that. Here I calculated about minus 23, and it actually came out pretty close to that. So this is a comparison with the six QSOs I had. And so you know, I label here the dates. And the, and the UTC time and so on and so forth. And then finally, the, the, uh, the payoff is what is the receiver signal to noise ratio measured? And what is the, say, the mean value? So that you can see in one standard deviation. So you can see predicting what the big guns have is actually pretty easy because they don't have the polarization issue. On the other hand, on my side, it's a gamble. I don't know what the polarization is going to be. And then later on, <laughs> unfortunately, I found out that I had a problem with my LNA. It turns out that the LNA didn't have uh, 12 volts anymore. I'm not sure why the ICOM isn't providing it, and there may be other issues, but you can see that I tried February, March, April, May, and July, and I had uh, January, February, and, and May working, and March, April, and July didn't work. So it's not an easy thing to do. So signal-to-noise ratio is greatly affected by the polarization loss for me. And this is the proof. You know, you, it's really fun to get a QSL card in an EME communication. This one's from 
from Russia, Slovenia, Italy. This guy had one of the biggest systems. And so I thought, I looked at it. Oh, I can do this. I don't need the earth, the ground gain, right? Barely worked, barely worked. And then more recently in May, uh, the Netherlands, also confirmed on log, log book of the world, which is nice, not all these guys do that. England. And then this is an EQSL from Spain, which doesn't quite count, except for the fact that he did log book of the world. And it's also on QRZ.com. So I sent him a card, he didn't get back to me. I'm sure that's happened to you on a number of occasions. So this is a summary of the, of the EMA uh, work. So started off by doing a systems analysis, just like if I was at work, is this going, is it possible to do? How much is it going to cost? And a goal, trying to do this before the end of the year. I had to buy some parts, obviously, and, and software to model things. By the way, I'm using that now to model uh, antenna arrays. Should I have two horizontal, two vertical? How, what's the separation? Can I do a horizontal and vertical? What's the separation? You know, the, what happens is if they're too close, then the VSWR goes up on one of the antennas. Okay, so this is a, just a repeat of what I said. So I consider this a QRP um, system. Uh, power aperture products about 39 dBiW. And you can't apply that necessarily to the other, the other frequencies because the gain is a function of frequency and ap aperture size. So this is strictly speaking for two meters. And I need to work big gun stations. I could not hear a station that had the same equipment I have. And then I have to operate right now at moonrise or moonset. And, and practically speaking, it's just moonrise because moonset isn't as convenient. I need longer cable, more losses. So what am I going to do about all that? First of all, I built a bias T to supply 12 volts to LNA. There's a nice one in, in uh, I think, QS, uh, QEX, whatever. And, um, and I bought a second uh, element, a nine element antenna from M squared. And uh, I built a PVC boom, it has to be uh, non-conductive, obviously. It's about 10 foot separation between these antennas at this wavelength. And I'm gonna try the two horizontal, and I'm gonna try one horizontal, one vertical. Uh, and I'm gonna test with the horizontal vertical uh, combination, an adaptive polarization receiver. So where do you get that? There, there are expensive ways to do it. I think that I can do it with a, an um, SDR Play RSP Duo, which just came out with software to do adaptive processing. And I've tested it at my home where I took a single signal, split it into two, have two unequal paths, and then I had a variable phase shift. I have like a trombone line, I could change the, the phase shift and you could see the, the vector, the phaser display on the software changing, so it tracks. So that was done at a nanowatt, and now I've got to do it at a very low signal level to see where the, the, control, uh, the control that adjusts the polarization fails. If it, if it fails, you can do this manually and you can guess at it, I suppose. That's a little harder to do, but uh, we'll see how that works out. But that's my solution right now to doing adaptive polarization, having a separate receiver aside. And by the way, I've run uh, the RSP Duo into F, you know, using FT8 and WSJ, uh, you know, using the software. You need what they call um, virtual audio cables. You know, the signal goes from the RSP, uh, the, the, um, RSP Duo on a single USB cable to the computer. Um, the software, the version 1.32, does all the processing, and it presents it. And you need virtual cables to connect that to the WSJTX software. So I've done that with FTA 8. So I think uh, it's, um, it's going to be fun trying that adaptive polarization and diversity reception. You can do this at HF. Uh, the SDRs work all over the place, so it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Now, I just have... By the way, I should say, you can get copies of these slides, and I wrote a paper on this, presented it at the um, VHF Super Conference in April. It's less than this, because I have additional QSOs. But if you want, you can um, either check qrz.com, you find my email there, and I'll email you the charts, the latest charts, and the paper, if you want. The references, so these are the references from the paper, so you can look at the websites if you need the software. 
And this is what a JT65D sounds like. This is the sound of the signal from Rhode Island 